we're studying the Gospel of Luke. Now, last week we saw Jesus' power over natural forces. We said we were going to see three passages that all talked about his power. Um, today it's going to be over spiritual forces. Last week in a squall that overpowered seasoned mariners, Jesus spoke a word to the winds and the waves, and the laws of physics were changed. On the shore, Jesus faced a different kind of storm. It was a terrible storm in a man's soul. And again, he's going to speak a word, this time change a man's life, and more than that, open up a very resistant area to the gospel. We're in Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 29. Let me read this to you. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said in a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. And then the demons came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. And then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And so he got into the boat and returned. This is another one of the pictures I got uh, when I was on the Sea of Galilee. This is looking at the northeast coast. This is the area mentioned in our text, and you can see there are many places, some close to the sea, some higher up where a herd of pigs could easily race over the cliff. Although not very far from Capernaum and the Galilee that Jesus knew, this area was a world away from simple Judaism. It lies in a region called the Decapolis, or Ten Cities. The Greeks had followed the conquest of Alexander the Great down past Syria into the west of Jordan and the Sea of Galilee. In the days of Rome, the west of Galilee was staunchly Jewish, while the east of Galilee were settlements mostly Gentile in population, culture, religion, art, city design, the works. That's why we find a herd of pigs in this area, not the sort of thing you find in Jewish country. In the parable of the prodigal son, when the young man travels to the big city and, and wastes his inheritance, he ends up feeding pigs. This is the area Jesus had in mind. The gospel often speaks of how Jesus cast out demons. And when individual situations are recorded, they're very similar to this one. A complete mental takeover by a demonic spirit, usually for, well, for some time. The spirit speaks through the person's mouth and moves with his or her body and so on. When Jesus encountered people who were demon-possessed, he cast the spirit out. Just as with the storm at sea, no wind-up to the pitch, no fancy words, no arcane rituals, no sweat. He just tells the demon to get out. But while the storm was a natural occurrence, demon possession is an entirely different thing. Now, demon possession may have some uh, symptoms, if you will, uh, that are similar to natural afflictions like Parkinson's disease or dementia, multiple personality disorder, and so on. But our example shows us that it's not the same thing. Demons had information that the afflicted man could not know. Not only Jesus' earthly reputation, but his divine origin. The pig stampede showed that there was more than natural forces involved. And after the exorcism, the man seemed perfectly normal instantly. And apparently Jesus did this many times. 
In my early Christian experience, I was part of several fellowships who cast out demons regularly. They cast demons out of houses before people moved in. We'd cast demons out of each empty room in the house. Um, uh, they cast out demons of lust and demons of gluttony. And I tried my hand out at once. I, I tried to cast a demon out of a cat. It's not one of my most proud moments, but anyway. Um, in, in our naivete, um, we thought that spiritual warfare consisted only of demonic possession. And of course, that's not true. In fact, after the cross and resurrection, demon possession quickly falls off the biblical map. Only a couple of instances of it in the book of Acts, and the subject is not raised in the epistles. Uh, we read earlier, spiritual warfare is dealt with, of course, but they're not the kind of thing we see in this text or any instruction about what to do or anything. Why? I think that as Christianity spread, Satan changed his tactics. My reading of the Bible is that the angel, Lucifer, is a very great created being. He expected to rule this planet. He became incensed when God gave dominion to creatures of dust. Lucifer dedicated himself to twisting the image of God in mankind into a mockery of what God intended in hopes that God would become so disgusted with us, judge and destroy us, leaving him in charge. And consequently, there has been a spiritual war in the background of all human history. God redeeming a fallen people back into his image, Satan and his demonic forces working overtime to twist us from something noble into something loathsome so that pure desire becomes lust, intellect becomes foolishness, medicine becomes addiction, success becomes arrogance, and arrogance becomes narcissism. Discretion becomes cowardice. Attractiveness becomes seduction. Strength becomes oppression. The study of Daniel and Revelation suggests to me that Satan prosecutes his war by analyzing any given human culture and choosing whatever techniques will most effectively dehumanize that population. In a superstitious society in the ancient world, in many places in the world today, demon possession is a great tactic. It's a very real thing. Turn a few weak souls into living nightmares, screaming, naked, uncontrollable, even more terrifying, unable to control themselves. And that inspires all kinds of superstitions and idolatries. When you visit the Decapolis, what you see there is ruins of ancient temples, a variety of gods, each one a parody of the true and living God, all drawing attention away from him so they can protect people from the demons. But demon possession is just one tactic. I want to show you a passage. You might know this. It's in 2 Samuel 24. It says that there was a time when David decided to number the people. He decided to take a census in order to see how large an army he could raise. And in the context, it was an egotistical defiance on his part, an assertion that maybe it wasn't just God's intervention. I mean, maybe it was his own greatness that was delivering Israel all this time. Even David's generals understood what motivated the census, and they pleaded with him not to do it. And the inevitable result was God's punishment. It was a sad, avoidable tra tragedy, and it hurt a lot of people. Why do I tell this story? Because when you look in the parallel passage in 1 Chronicles, there's one other detail listed. David's pride was incited. It was tempted by Satan. Now, obviously, David did not know this at the time. It's only in hindsight. But somehow, David got to, excuse me, Satan got to David's pride. Maybe he got to him with flattering advisors. Maybe through a lover. We don't know. We have no idea how he did it. And that's terrifying. It makes the temptation of leaders a much scarier thing than demonic possession. With a demoniac, you can at least see the devil at work. You can see him coming a mile away. But how do you guard against a leader becoming full of himself? And a leader of God's people at that. 
The Screw Tape Letters is a, a lighthearted book from C.S. Lewis about a, a very sober subject, and that is the tactics of the demonic. And one passage bears repeating. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail the materialist or the magician with the same delight. Where superstition reigns, the relatively cheap strategy of demon possession remains effective, I believe, to this very day. In the Christian West, however, Christianity has so shaped culture and developed civilization that superstition, while of course it's very alive and well, it's, it's, it's underneath. And it's not so effective a tactic here. We're too sophisticated for that. Seriously. What would you do if you look outside your house and you see a completely naked man slobbering obscenities and waving a chain around like this? What would you do? Would you go out and uh, command the demon to depart? What would you do? What would your neighbor do? You know what they'd do. You'd call the police. And the demoniac would be tased. Or the SWAT team would put him down, or he'd be put away. I mean, it, it just, I don't expect to see this sort of thing very often here because it doesn't give Satan a very big bang for his buck. He's not going to be scaring people like that anymore. Not, some places of the world, yes, but here, not so much. Unfortunately, at least this is my belief, I believe Satan and his confederates, demons, are more active in America than the most superstitious backwater of this planet. I believe that Lucifer's influence is right out in the open. In every shouted and sung blasphemy that is downloaded millions of times, in every decision, every social decision that makes our society less humane, in every casual abortion that completely eliminates the entire contribution which one human being could have made, Satan's influence is right out in the open, even in the church of Jesus Christ, where busyness keeps rich fellowship from flourishing, where shame keeps addiction secret, where self-righteousness keeps at arm's length people that Christ would like to reach. Lucifer's influence is more evident in America in every political season with every invention we use to dull our ability to relate to each other and make wholesome work less appealing and separate us further from the earth and its creatures whose dominion define our purpose. Luth Lucifer's influence is open and it's everywhere while he himself remains virtually invisible. <laughs> Let's smirk. Let's smirk at those superstitious fools who give offerings to idols and put garlic on their doors. Let's smugly laugh at the devil with his horns and his pitchfork and his tail. <laughs> While right in our midst, dressed in popular fashion, with a smartphone in his pocket and a latte in his hand, Lucifer laughs right alongside us. So what do we do? Well, trying to answer that question is far too much for this text. It would take us into a study of Satan's tools, his methods, like temptation that weakens our integrity, or accusation that supplants noble aspirations with fruitless, self-destructive guilt as a motivation. We'd have to work through the whole armor of God that Paul talks about. It's just so rich. We have to especially talk about prayer because Jesus taught us every day to pray that we wouldn't fall into temptation or the strength of the evil one. Every day. I pray about, I pray about protection from Satan all the time. And I assume he's involved in everything. Everything. And we'd have to discover our own superstitions and face them so we don't miss what Satan is really doing while we're exercising empty rooms and cats. We can't do all this today. But what we can do is note one of the most powerful weapons in spiritual warfare. It's one that Jesus uses in this situation. 
I'm not talking about uh, the exorcism, which delivered one person wonderfully. I'm talking about what Jesus set in play to reach a whole town, a whole city, a whole region. This was Gentile country. Preaching the kingdom the way he had to the Jews would not be as easily understood with all these, all these Old Testament concepts of atonement and so on. And Mark tells us that he's going to come back into this area later. So he softened up the stronghold of Satan that many might come to faith later. And what did he do? He said, return to your home and you declare how much God has done for you. And of course, by doing that, the man is not just declaring, he is showing. The whole town knew him to be a human wreck. No self-control. Dangerous. Out of his mind. Un unfit for society. When he gave testimony to what Jesus had done, it wasn't a sales pitch. It was an explanation of how he had been transformed. Not only religiously, but in ways that anybody could understand was a change for the better. You couldn't miss it. Well, what was that explanation? How did it happen? I'll tell you. It was, it was Jesus. It's that simple. It was Jesus. And by the time Jesus came there again, preaching this time, everyone, we're told in this passage, everyone would have heard this man's story. And this Jewish theology might sound a little strange, but they would be well motivated to listen. You see, witness and evangelism, sometimes we use these words interchangeably, but they're actually two very, very different ideas. But they overlap, and they overlap in a very powerful way. Witness or testimony, that tells my story. And evangelism, of course, that tells the biblical story of Jesus. Jesus' story, he says, the gospel is the whole Bible. It's the whole Bible. And it has lots and lots of different points to it. But the essence of it is very, very simple. Even the thief on the cross who may not have known anything else could get it. And that is that Christ brings people to God. That's the core of it. My story is what God has done for me in Christ. My story. And it could be anything. And all our stories are different. How God calmed my, my mind or gave me a purpose. Or how, how he stopped me, helped me stop smoking or saved my marriage or lifted my anxiety, or relieved my bitterness, or helped me come to terms with a weakness, or made me a person of integrity, or maybe he was there for me when my father died. There are no two stories are alike, and, and none are better than others as long as they're true. Our stories, our witness, our testimonies, they don't save anybody. But they just might spark an interest in Jesus Christ. And motivate a desire to listen to some of this wonderful theology, wonderful truth. Give Jesus a listen, which is great, because he can save anyone. Just as he had power over the natural forces, Jesus has power over spiritual forces. Satan lost the demoniac when the demon was exercised, but Satan lost a whole lot more when the man went back and gave credit to Jesus to the whole town. Satan started to lose ground. And he's still losing ground. And the gates of hell can't stop Christ church. So let's push back the gates of hell. By telling someone what God has done for me. And when they ask how, tell them. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. And then if you can, tell them, tell them Jesus' story. And let him bring people to God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for all that you do to bring us to Jesus, to bring us back to Jesus. You've been so good to us, and I know that prayer might taste a little sour for those of us facing soul-sapping challenges right now. But, Lord, if you could stop those demons in their tracks, if you could send them packing and restore sanity and hope and joy to that man that we read about, could you not do the same for brothers and sisters here who desperately need you? 
Could you not do so for us, for me? Could you not do so for friends among us who do not yet know Jesus, but who are beginning to wonder if he could make all the difference to them? Answer these questions in our hearts. We pray as we come to your table in Christ's name. In a minute, we're going to be uh, taking, uh, take, partaking of the Lord's Supper, coming down the center, and either taking the elements here or you know, taking them back and partaking while we sit down. In one sense, this Lord's Supper is a simple ritual. It's practiced in Christ's church. But when you add faith to it, it becomes more than that. It becomes an occasion for real communion with the risen Lord Jesus. Everyone here who has publicly confessed Christ at some point has been baptized as he commanded in any Christian church, are welcome to participate. There is no greater opportunity to thank him for what he's done for you, ask him to free you from a sin that had got its teeth into you recently, lift a burden that's crushing you, or dedicate yourself to his service. What better time and place to do any of those things than here and now with God's people? Because every believer who participates has some reason to touch base with him. And through his spirit and through our faith, he's here for each one of us. But what if faith is a tantalizing possibility that's still just out of reach? Then you would do best to not participate in the sacrament, but rather to open your soul as best you can to God. Listen to the music, think if you can, pray, because what you need most is not the sacrament. What you need most who you need most is Jesus Christ himself. He's here. In fact, we're never far from him. And as we sing, ask him to touch your heart and listen for him to call your name and follow him to someone who will give you the truth that leads to life. He did that for me. And I know he can do it for you. I, I delivered to you <clears throat> that which I received that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And after the supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Because we're told as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again, and he is coming again. So in his name again, I invite you to his table.